Good morning, and thank you for this uh, invitation. I am very happy to be here in this uh, symposium. So this is the, the idea for the symposium, uh, for the uh, symposium number 12 of Omicron. I will be presenting ideas about shielding low frequency magnetic fields. This is a topic very important for electronic designers that are suffering problems with uh, whole sensors or with audio systems, especially when they are uh, receiving a magnetic field from uh, leakage in transformers, from uh, magnets in speakers, or from any other source of low frequency uh, magnetic field. Uh, the idea is that uh, we are in electronics usually uh, working with aluminum, with copper, with uh, steel for shielding in many applications, especially in radio frequency applications. But when we go down in frequency, the problems appears because that materials are not uh, good for for shielding. And this is what I will try to cover today. We will have a review of uh, theory, and we will have demos so we, we can uh, see uh, the ideas working with real circuits. So um, my laboratory is the HF Magic Lab. We are in uh, Spain, in Zaragoza, and we are working in EMI and EMC in the signal integrity and radio frequency problems, uh, in general in high frequency, that is the, because the, the laboratory is called the HF. Magic is coming from the idea that for many electronic designers, high frequency uh, create uh, some uh, problems that are not uh, easy to solve, uh, considering parasitics, considering uh, coupling between different components in a circuit, considering um, uh, hidden impedances or anomalous effects that are difficult to understand if you are training it only in circuit theory. No? So um, the idea of uh, the session today is to review first the theory of shielding. We will try to learn uh, why we use ma uh, metal for shielding, what happened with the, the metal uh, or what variables about this metal uh, create a good seal for your application. And we will try to discover why electric and magnetic fields are not working in the same way for these materials. We will try to understand how the problem is dependent with frequency. And we will try to uh, answer the question, what is low frequency in shielding? Low frequency is 10 hertz. Low frequency is 1 kilohertz. Low frequency is 100 kilohertz. We will try to answer this question. Finally, I will present some common techniques to solve this problem, especially combine it with the demos. I have several demos with uh, specific circuits, and uh, we will be using the Bode 100 to measure the effectiveness of shielding of several materials, several common materials. Well, let's start with the basic theory. Uh, shielding is the idea of uh, protecting one area uh, in, in your circuit or in your house or in your facilities from a specific electromagnetic uh, energy. Sometimes you are interested in shielding for emissions. So your circuit is some kind of uh, aggressive circuit with high or low frequency signals. And you put a metal enclosure here in blue color around the circuit to avoid this energy going out of this area. No? One example of this is in a radio communication system, the oscillator. Or, for example, in a uh, power supply, switching mode power supply, if you are shielding the full power supply to avoid emissions in some uh, frequencies that can create problems in EMC um, a test. The other possibility is when you are interested in immunity. When you are considering immunity, the idea is that your high gain amplifier or your um, operational amplifier uh, working with low uh, amplitude analog signals or some specific area that is sensitive is protected with a metal enclosure around the product. No? So we have uh, two important questions to answer is what material can I use for this protection? And second, what variables are important in the effectiveness of this material for this specific application? The idea for when we are explaining uh, shielding, the idea is exactly the same. You are thinking in emissions or you are thinking in immunity. This is the first idea. The second idea is how you can study this problem. You have two possibilities. Um, I usually say to my students, if you don't have friends, hobbies, family, you can try to learn 
uh, Maxwell theory, no? Maxwell theory, you know, uh, obviously, obviously it's a joke, no? But Maxwell theory is a very complicated way to understand uh, problems in an easy way. You need time, and uh, today, for example, you can use uh, very complex uh, simulation tools like uh, I don't know HFSS from ANSYS or any other vendor uh, using 3D uh, element. Um, uh, finite element uh, solvers, no? Uh, but obviously, if you want to understand the problem in a very, very well uh, way, you need to learn electromagnetic theory. You need to apply the Maxwell equations. In, in Sildin, many times we don't use this path and we go to the Skelkunov theory. In the Skelkunov theory, we try to simplify the problem and we talk about the ceiling effectiveness in decibels. The ceiling effectiveness in decibels is how much is the uh, attenuation, how much is the effect of this metal in the reduction of one specific field. So in one point in the space, you have one value of magnetic field, electric field, electromagnetic field, and then you put the shield in place. And this uh, uh, field is reduced. The difference between with and without the seal is what we call the sealing effectiveness. And there are two important effects creating this effectiveness. The most important, but not the most important, one of the most important is the reflection. Reflection in decibels is the idea that you are creating mismatching between impedances. The idea is that the energy that is going through this space find the metal and it's reflected back. The second idea about the shielding effectiveness is that part of the effectiveness came from the absorption. The absorption is the idea that the energy, when it's going through the material, part of the energy is dissipated. Part of the energy is not able to go to the other side of the screen. The idea of uh, shielding effectiveness with reflection and absorption gives the, the possibility to um, calculate how much is the effectiveness of a material in reflection, how much is the effectiveness in absorption, and then we add both of them to calculate the total shielding effectiveness. Okay, so let's try to understand the variables for this problem. The first idea is to apply this for specific fields. You can consider to apply this to electric field. This is the E, you find here, shielding effectiveness for electric field in decibels. You can apply this to the magnetic field. Again, it's in decibels. Uh, the idea is to compare how much is or the magnetic field without versus with the shield in place. I repeat, if at this point P, I have a magnetic or electric field, something like this, this is H, when we put the shield in place, the magnetic field is reduced. The difference between the first one and the second one is the shielding effectiveness. And because when we are working with electric or magnetic field, like when we are working with voltage and current, we uh, plot usually these magnitudes in logarithmic way, we will need to use the 20 value uh, in front of the logarithm. No, you remember that if we are working with power, we use 10, but for electric and magnetic field, we use 20. The equation is exactly the same. And remember that the shield in effectiveness, this value will be uh, created thanks be that we have reflections, we have absorption, and we have an additional term that we usually we uh, not consider that is called multiple reflections. This is this term D that I will explain in a few uh, moments, no? So how is the uh, dependence of this shielding effectiveness of the variables in your problem? Here you can find the main variables for your problem. The effectiveness you are going to obtain is related with one, the frequency. is not the same shielding one kilohertz, 100 kilohertz or one gigahertz, it's obvious. The second important idea is the material. Usually in shielding, the most important value, the most important variables of the materials are the permeability and the conductivity. It's not the same to use uh, gold, uh, copper, aluminium, or steel. These materials have different variables, and these variables are the important uh, the keys for the uh, effectiveness of this solution.
Another important variable is the thickness. The thickness is uh, important if you are considering uh, to work by absorption. Remember that reflection is what you obtain in the first phase of the silt. So the signal is arriving to the silt and is reflecting in the first layer. But when the signal is trying to go into the material, as the thickness is bigger and bigger, as your material is uh, uh, thick and thick, then you have more absorption for the signal. And finally, another important variable is the distance. Is the distance between the culprit, between the origin of the signal and the material and the silt. But not because increasing the distance you have less amplitude. It's because depending on where you put the silt, you are in the far field or in the near field. What is multiple reflections? Let me try to explain with a drawing the idea of the equations. If this is my material and I have this thickness in the material, when the signal is coming to my system, part of the energy is reflected. This is what you can see here. The reflection is an idea of a mismatching situation. You are mismatching um, impedances. It's like when you are filtering. If you have a system in electronics with some kind of output impedance, something like this, and you have a system that is receiving the signal that is the victim or the load impedance, when we put a capacitor or when we put an inductor in series, the idea is that this capacitor or the inductor are creating mismatch and the signal is not able to arrive to the uh, load and is reflected to the source. No? So this is something similar. If you have a system where the impedances are very different remember from the idea from the transmission line, when the impedances are very different, the signal is reflected. So when we compare impedances in reflection, the idea is that we compare the wave impedance with the sealed impedance. The sealed impedance is the uh, impedance of the um, sealed in the first layer. The wave impedance, remember, in electromagnetic signals is the ratio between the electric and the magnetic field. So when you have a signal that is with a big quantity in electric field related with the magnetic field, the idea is this is a high impedance source. When you have a high magnetic field, this is a low impedance source. If you have a strong difference in these impedances, the wave impedance and the sealed impedance, you will have a, a strong reflection. You will have a good sealing effect. Look at this. This is not a problem with um, uh, uh, the thickness. This is not related with the thickness. This is related with the first layer. That is because in many applications you can use metallic paints. With metallic paints, you have microns in thickness. It's very, very small the thickness of the material, but you have a good uh, sealing effect because you are working by reflection. But part of your energy is able to go into the material. Let's go, draw in blue color. So if the signal is going to the material, uh, as the signal is going through the material is being attenuated. So at the end, in the other side of the shield, you have a magnetic field, you have an electric field that is lower than when we have uh, the situation without the shield, because we, ha we have part is reflected, part is absorbed. This absorption term is related with what we call the skin depth. No, or a skin effect, okay, is uh, um, um, uh, inversely proportional to the uh, conductivity of the material. But if the thickness of the material is very small or the same, if the absorption is very, very small, the idea is that part of the energy that is arriving to the second frontier can be reflected again, can be reflected again, and then in the protected area, you have more field than intended. Usually, to put this in numbers, a typical situation in decibels can give you, I don't know, for example, is 150 dBs. From this 150 dBs, in reflection, perhaps you have 60 dBs. And perhaps you have in absorption, the, the, let me put here in, instead of 60, let me put 50, so we can make numbers easier. So the absorption is something like, for example, 110 dBs. So 110 plus 50 is 160 dBs. Why you don't have 
150 because we have a multiple reflection effect that is minus 10 dB. The multiple reflect uh, um, the multiple reflection term is negative. It's creating an effect of reducing the effectiveness in, in the previous equation. But usually when the absorption is more than 9, 10 dB, the re multiple reflections effect is not considered because the signal cannot do multiple reflections without attenuation. This is the general uh, um, situation. In my experience, only with metallic paints is where I have found that multiple reflections is an important uh, situation. So considering this idea and considering that we understand these variables, where is the key factors to have success in shielding? Is one, what material are you using? Second, if you have leakage in a slots or apertures in this shield, and third, the input and output of cables. Usually, usually, uh, in general, no, let's let's in general, we obtain shielding effectiveness more than 150 dB. If you are using aluminium, you are using copper, you are using steel, you will get more than 150 dB of attenuation of sealed ineffectiveness. So in, a, in your general applications, what you need to take care is not the material that is important, but is not the most important element. The most important element to fail in shielding is the leakage in slots and apertures. And second, the way your cables are going in and out of the shield for powering data or analog or digital signals. There is only one exception where this is not true. The exception is when you have low frequency magnetic field. So the idea is if you are trying to seal a field that is basically magnetic and the frequency is very low, you will not be able to seal by reflection or by absorption. In other words, magnetic field low in frequency is able to cross any material. And this is what we will be trying to explain today. If you study this problem, you will be able to calculate for any material in any frequency in different situations, how is the shielding effectiveness for one specific application. You can see here two different drawings. Before explaining these graphs, let me draw the general idea. The general idea to understand these graphs is something like this. What happened with the absorption? The absorption with materials is always doing something like this. Let me draw here. This is the absorption in decibels. This is the frequency. Remember this graph. You will do this. You will do this. You will do this. So always with frequency, absorption increase a lot. You can put a number here, for example, I don't know, 100 kilohertz. So for frequencies higher than 100 kilohertz, the shielding effectiveness is very important, at least because we have absorption in decibels. You can put here if you want something like 50, 60 dBs. So what happened with reflection? In reflection, the idea is we have different possibilities. We can have this behavior, with frequency. So what happened if you have this reflection and you have this absorption? The idea is that you, if you add both of them, if this is still ineffectiveness and the absorption is doing something like this and the reflection is doing something like this, if you add both of them, the shield ineffectiveness is doing something like this. And this number is the number I was saying to you that is always more than 150 dBs. So in any application where you have this behavior, the idea is that you will be uh, shielding very easily. But we have another possibility. The other possibility is that reflection is doing something like this. Is the reflection is doing something like this, that is the other possibility, absorption is not changed. The idea is that in my shielding effectiveness plot, you will need to consider that this is your reflection that this is your absorption, and then is, uh, adding both of them, you will see that the 
shielding effectiveness is in this way. So what happened at low frequencies? At low frequencies, shielding effectiveness is reduced because you don't have absorption and you don't have reflection. So this is what I am trying to explain in this example here. The first idea is when the source of my electric pro of my problem is basically a high impedance source. That means what? You have a strong electric field and you have a small magnetic field. More electric field than magnetic field. Remember, this is a, the wave impedance. It's volts per meter divided by amps per meter. This is ohms. If you have a high impedance source, the idea is that absorption is doing something like this. Like always, this is the absorption. And the reflection is doing something like this in green color is being reduced and at this point reflection change in a slope what happened at this point at this point at this frequency the idea is the distance between this frequency is related with the distance between the near and the far field okay so in the in the frequency where you are in the near or in the far field is the frequency where the slope in the reflection term change in the slope. So what happened if the source of your signal is low in impedance, is a, a, sorry, low electric field divided by a high magnetic field. This is a case, for example, you have a loop. You have a loop, you will be creating basically magnetic field, you have high current, low voltage, no? So the idea is that you will go to the second plot. This will be the absorption, it's like previously, but you will see that the reflection that can be perfectly calculated is doing this. And that is because you can see in the slide this symbol. Be careful. At low frequencies, you will not be able to shield, high, to shield this element. The, the last theoretical idea about this near and far field is to remember for all of you that are not familiar with this term where we have this distance, no? So if you plot here the wave impedance for your electrical signal, for your electromagnetic signal. This is wave impedance in ohms, remember. And this is distance. Look, consider, for example, that the origin of the signal is here. It's a circuit, it's a component, it's a, it's a full equipment. Eh? This is distance and we are in X equal to zero and consider that you are very far from this system. No, I am far from the system. What happened if the uh, uh, origin of this signal, no, no, before that, what happened if I am very far from the system? I am here and I calculate for this uh, distance, how much is the ratio between the electric and the magnetic field? And you will see that this value is exactly 377 ohms. Why 377 ohms? Because is this is the result of this calculation. Is you need to compare the permeability and the permittivity of the uh, propagation media. In this case, the free space. Okay, this is 377. What happens if you are here and you go far away? If you go far, the value is again 377. Why? Because in this distance, electric field is attenuated with the distance and the magnetic field is attenuated with the distance in the same proportion. So the ratio is constant, is 377. So look at this. If you understand this, uh, this uh, explanation, you will see that in the far field, when we are far from the system, the uh, ratio between the electric and the magnetic field, the wave impedance is not related with the origin of the signal. It's related with the media. If you will go close to the circuit, at some point, the wave impedance can do two different things. Perhaps do something like this, or perhaps we'll be doing something like this. What is necessary to have one behavior or the other? When the origin of the signal is a high impedance source, let me draw this with something like a monopole, eh? The idea is that they have a strong electric field and a small magnetic field. The idea is that the wave impedance is more than 377 ohms. If the origin of the signal is something like 
let's say a loop, I mean a low electric field for a very high magnetic field, the idea is that the wave impedance will be lower than 377 ohms. And remember what we are doing. We are comparing impedances when we are doing shielding, no? So if the wave impedance is here, and considering the metals we are using in uh, shielding, when the metal is a low impedance, is you will understand why any material, any metal, is good for shielding if you are in the in the far field, because 377 ohms is big enough compared with the uh, impedance of the aluminium or copper or something like that. And you will understand why electric field, when you are in the near field, is so easy to shield because it's better than the wave impedance in the far field, the, the, this uh, uh, plane wave, because the impedance is bigger than 377. And the problem or the risk if, is if you are in this area here. When you are in this area here, when you are at low impedances, then that will be very easy to shield. And the distance between the near and the far field, let me remember you, that this distance is more or less lambda over six. So it's related with frequency. If you are in a very high frequency, you arrive to the far field very easily. If you are in the near field, uh, in the low frequencies, you will be in, in the far field, uh, sorry, in the near field very easily. This is what happened at low frequencies. Remember that uh, the idea is that I want to seal this material. So if I am using this sealed, let me draw this in, in, in pink color, for example, or in this color. Uh, this is my material. Uh, let me draw in this way. So the idea is that if you put the sealed in this position, you are in, in the far field. And if you put the sealed close to the source, you will be in the near field. And if you are in the near field, the idea is that if the source of your problem is electric field, you will be, uh, you will see high effectiveness. But if your the origin of your signal is low in impedance, you will not see good efficiency. This is the, the general idea to understand the problem. So let's go to the demos. Right? I'm going to switch the screen. Let me, sir, let me uh, change uh, uh, this one. Let me change the screen uh, to this screen here. Let me see. Where is the screen? Uh, this one. Okay. So now I hope you see uh my screen with two cameras and this oscilloscope screen now i'm going to use this camera not the oscilloscope okay so what you see here is a now nah, this is only for for my solder uh, uh wire but the important thing is here the magnet this is a magnet magnetic field that obviously is low in frequency is dc so you can find this kind of magnets, for example, in control of speed in motors, or you can find this magnet in speakers in audio systems. And the magnetic field that is around the system is strong. And here I have a clip. The clip is uh, using this uh, small wire. So when I put the clip close to the magnet, it's floating in the air. And now let's try to shield this problem. Let's take first this material. This is aluminum foil, like the one you have in the kitchen. So let me remove this. And let you put here the material and you see that nothing happens. Let me try with copper. This is a plate of copper, two layers of copper in a PCB. You can see that nothing happens. The magnetic material, the magnetic field is crossing very easily why because we are in dc and we are in the near field no we consider that for very low frequencies 10 10 hertz 100 hertz 500 hertz the lambda is kilometers in distance so to be in the far field you need to be very 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 far from the source eh? where the magnetic field probably is reduced by the distance by attenuation this is brass but it's, it's something similar. But now I'm going to introduce this material. 
let me try to introduce this material. And look at this. Look, when I go close to the system, you can see that the clip start to vibrate and it destroyed the uh, connectivity. Okay, it's the same with this other material here. I'm going to connect here. This is more effective. This is more effective. Remember, when things are more effective, let me remove my hand. When things are more effective, usually they are expensive. Okay, so what is what I am doing here? What I am using here is, let me change again the screen here. Okay, this way. What I am using here is the idea of a very high permeability material. When you need to shield low frequency magnetic fields, you need to go to materials where the permeability is very, very, very high. The relative permeability of aluminum, copper, uh, uh, gold is one. Uh, that means related with the free space. In a steel, we have more permeability. That is because steel usually is more effective sealed in low frequency magnetic materials. But in this application, we need a material with uh, thousands in the value of mu per, uh, perme uh, relative permeability. And the idea is that when you have a material with a very high permeability for some specific frequency, the idea is that this material is creating a low reluctance path for the magnetic flux lines. And the idea is that the magnetic flux lines that are trying to arrive to the victim are redirected far from the system. So this is what is happening in my experiment. In my experiment, I have here, I have here the magnet, okay? And the magnet is creating some kind of magnetic field lines, something like this, no? Okay, something like this. And the clip I am using is floating, this is the wire, and the clip is here, okay? When I put the material close, it's not necessary to put in the middle, but when I put the material close instead without introducing inside uh, between the, the clip and the, uh, and the magnetic field, I see the effect. What happened with the magnetic field lines, I'm going to draw the magnetic field lines now in, in for example, in, in black color, what happened with the, the magnet is that they are redirected, okay? They are not able to arrive to the uh, clip, no? As I introduce more and more and more the magnetic material between both of them, the magnetic field lines are going in this direction. This is the typical material, but at high frequencies that you will find in uh, RFID systems or wireless powered systems, no? You will see that they are using a coil to create the magnetic field in the reader or in the transmitter, and below the uh, coil, you will find a material that at the frequency of interest is creating a low reluctance path. So the magnetic field lines are able to do this and uh, with more efficiency for the um, function of this system for coupling with a reader or something like that. And additionally, in uh, this area, in this area here, there is no magnetic field is protected no so uh, as a second experiment i am going to show you the idea of the oscilloscope for this for this experiment i have the other uh, camera is this camera here and in the lateral view let me remove this here so you can see here the experiment. Let me put in the center here. Okay. And I'm going to explain what I have here. Let me put here the camera. Here. That's why. Right. It's very easy. This is this is only the the, the support from the microscope I am using for supporting this uh, magnetic field sensor. So with this magnetic field sensor, I am measuring magnetic field and I am exciting a coil. This coil here is being excited by this circuit. This circuit is uh, able to amplify a low frequency signal. The low frequency signal is coming from these wires, the wires that are coming from my signal generator. I will start now introducing here a 500 Hertz signal with a 100 millivolts peak to peak amplitude. And here I will obtain 
a high uh, voltage output. This is the power for the amplifier. This is around nine volts. And this is the output to the coil, okay? So what you see in the screen, or what you are going to see in the screen is the current in the coil. I am using this current probe eh, to measure the current in the, in the coil is in the yellow color in the screen of the oscilloscope. And the output of the uh, sensor is going to channel number two, that is the uh, green color. So let's start powering the system and introducing the signal, okay? So now you can see here in yellow color is the current that is going in the coil. I am creating a magnetic field. This is typical, for example, if you are uh, an RFID system, you have a, um, a inducting, induction heating system, or you, are, uh, you have the, the current in a transformer, or you have, a, I don't know, you have a lot of situations where you have a low frequency signal going through a, a coil. And the green color is the signal in the sensor, some kind of a phase difference, obviously, because I have not uh, uh, make any kind of uh, uh, the skew uh, pro um, situation. Okay, so let's increase the distance from the sensor to the coil, and you will see that if I increase the distance, the magnetic field is reduced. No, in in this in this example, you can consider that the the sensor is working like, for example, the victim of the problem, and this is the origin of the problem. And you see, if I increase the distance the magnetic field is reduced. This is obvious, I know, but this is one of the most important solutions for your problems, is to avoid the origin of the signal and the, um, and the, um, and the, um, the origin of the signal and the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, the arm switched on. Uh, the, the, the origin of the signal and the uh, victim must be separated. If we rotate, you can see that making a 90 degrees rotation, the problem disappear, no? Because this is another important thing, especially the victim of your problem is this kind of uh, magnetic field. Let me go down here and let me introduce in the middle this accessory. This is an accessory, it's a booth. So I can put in the middle so we can see the difference introducing the previous uh, materials. I use it in the experiment with the magnet. For example, what happens if I introduce aluminium? If I introduce aluminium, you can see that there is no difference in the amplitude of the signal. What happens if I introduce copper? If I introduce copper, no difference in the amplitude. What happens if I introduce brass? No difference. This is 500 hertz. What happens if I introduce the high permeability material? You can see the difference. Be careful because this magnetic material, I am using conetic material from Magnetic Shield Corporation. This kind of materials with high permeability can be easily saturated. So perhaps you need different materials with high permeability. Usually lower permeabilities are uh, more difficult to saturate. Okay, so depending on your application, you will need to do one thing or the other. And let me finish very quickly using the boat 100. To use the Bolt 100, I will be using the same amplifier with the same coil and the same magnetic field sensor. But instead of connecting to the oscilloscope, what I'm going is to connect the um, sensor to port number two in the Bolt 100. And in the output of the Bolt 100, I will obtain the signal for my amplifier. I am going to replace the signal generator with the Bode 100 signal generator, and the output of the sensor is what I am introducing in channel number two. So I can see the response of the shielding effectiveness. Let me open Bode 100. Okay. I hope you understand what I am doing. If not, while the system is starting, let me clean the screen. And this is what I am doing. No? This is the port 100. This is the output. This is the input. I am introducing the output to the power amplifier. I have here the magnetic sensor, the magnetic coil, creating the magnetic field. 
and I have here the sensor. So I can see how is the effect of coupling the signal from the output to the input with my magnetic field system. Let's put here the software of the boat 100. I select the measurement for to measure S21. Okay, and let me put the coil below the sensor. Wait a moment. Okay, let me start, for example, in 10 hertz. Remember, I am interested in low frequencies. And let me finish in 20 kilohertz. Okay, and let me make a sweep. Okay, something like this. I am not going to calibrate or something like that because we don't have time. Let me try to do this. Okay, something like this. Okay, so let's call this the uh, reference level, no? Now, this way, ah, okay, let me put the trace with more thickness so you can see easily and let me save in memory. Now, let's try to uh, introduce aluminum. When I introduce aluminum, I run again the test and you can see the difference is not important here, the lower part. Probably if I increase the magnitude, I will avoid this noise that I have here, but I'm, I, I have no time to make a perfect experiment, but I hope you will understand it. So at low frequencies, there is no difference. When we increase the frequency, remember, at frequencies higher than 10 kilohertz, attenuations start to be um, uh, higher. Okay, more attenuation eh? because uh, the aluminium has conductivity and we start to work by reflection. Let me see the copper. Copper is more conductive than aluminium. So let me see if we can appreciate the difference. This is copper. You can see copper is more effective than aluminium for this frequency range increasing from one kilohertz. Let me introduce brass between the two systems. With the, with the Bolt 100, you can test different material, different thickness, different frequencies, no? You can see brass create a better situation, but it's very close to the copper. And now, let me introduce this material, the high permeability material, so you can see the difference, okay? Like here, here is the, diff the idea. Here you can see that at these frequencies, we have 10 dBs of difference compared with the other materials. And at the high frequencies, because the, the conductivity is lower, we don't have so good shielding. Anyway, uh, we are on time. It's uh, uh, six minutes past the time. So if you are interested in the question and answer uh, period, I can try to repeat part of the experiment or to answer what you, uh, Florian, uh, I hope you enjoy the presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Arturo. I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, thanks for that. And we, we gave you five minutes more, but uh, thanks for keeping the time anyhow. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, actually, I do have a question, and that is, uh, would it be beneficial to lamellate the shield with regards to absorption by managing the eddy currents? Would this improve the absorption characteristics of the shield? Yes, yes. Yes, in my experience, yes. Mm -hmm. the, the important thing about shielding, in my opinion, is to be able to experiment with real measurements because it's very difficult to, you can do this by simulation, but for simulation uh, is one of the most important or the most difficult task will be to uh, have a model of the material. But if you have some experimental setup so you can compare really for your frequency of interest and for the magnitude of your field, how different solutions um, are working, that will be a good uh, point, uh, starting point for your decisions, engineering decisions. Okay. Then I have another question that is a feedback and question. At the same time, it says, excellent lecture. Do you have a book or a document that explains all the theory and includes the picture that you have drawn? No, uh, I have not a book. I have no time to write books, sorry. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't have problem to send to Omicron uh, the, the pictures I have down, done here. So you can receive the PDF file with the notes. 
And uh, the other question is, 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 is I don't remember. <laughs> no, it was the question. Uh, so, yeah, we can, that would be nice if we get the pictures and we yes. can update. No problem. Uh, no problem. The download. Um, then there is another question that is, uh, what was this uh, material called? The, the, the material, the, the high permeability material uh, is, a, is a material that you will identify in the, let me increase the size of the screen. Do you see my screen oh, or not? No? Okay. Wait no, a moment. Um, I will change. Now you're the presenter again. Now I can do it. Okay. This one. You can see here. Okay. So if you see in the notes I, I have sent to you, you will see that the materials with a very high permeability are typically known uh, like permalloy, mu metal, uh, nickel alloys, or things like that. But uh, steel and other typical materials for mechanical designs are in the lower part of the permeability. No, so uh, try to find manufacturers that call the material mu metal, permalloy, nickel, and the materials I was using in my presentation uh, is this one is uh, netic. I hope you can read from the camera or uh, the other material is Cornetic is from Magnetic Shielding Corporation is a company in the USA. You have different Cornetic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can read it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. And there is another um, question that is, I think you, to remember that you had two sicknesses or different types of the high mu, mu material. Can you show a measurement of the attenuation versus frequency for these materials too? But I think that's, uh, you probably don't have that on hand, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think he's uh, trying to compare, but the problem is that uh, the thickness of the materials is the same, but I have two high permeability materials, different materials. The netic material, is a lower permeability, but is more difficult to saturate. The kinetic mm -hmm. material has a higher permeability, better for shielding, but is easier uh, to be uh, saturated. So this is the, the idea. No, no, they are not different thickness. OK. Mm -hmm. uh, then another question, when we talk about medium frequencies, like 10 kilohertz to 1 megahertz, what are the materials that you would recommend? At the end, it depends. There is another variable you need to consider. One is cost, and the other is how sensitive is the victim and how aggressive is the uh, aggressor. No, so it, it depends how many decibels you want to to obtain. In my experience, from 10 kilohertz to one megahertz, some many times. Uh, uh, aluminium or steel or copper can work very well. Obviously, if you need to, to seal, remember that in my previous slide wow. here, you can see this effect that is very common at frequencies lower than one kilohertz, the permeability of these materials start to decrease. So they are start to be less effective. What which instrument? In, in 10 kilohertz and higher frequencies, probably it's better to switch to aluminum or steel or copper. Then uh, a short question. Uh, which instruments do you need to do on-site measurements of this kind? Uh, for on-site measurements, uh, I suppose that uh, one solution is to have a, something like the Bolt 100 to be able to cover the frequency range from 10 hertz or from DC to, to I don't know, 1 megahertz. And you need uh, one sensor. The sensor can be a commercial sensor, or you can use a coil. You can manu in my in my camera. You have seen my cameras. What, what I am using here is a uh, is a is a roll of wire. No, so it's a non uh, it's a coil without core. I don't like to use core here because the core can create nonlinearities and problems with frequency. No, so you take a lot of turns or you take something like this and you can calibrate in your laboratory uh, with uh, considering how is the output versus the frequency you are applying. No? If not, you can buy a, a commercial sensor and that is all you need. Mm 